give me a bit of a history about what yourself and your involvement in this in this cult. Sure. Well, I first joined this cult, believing it to be a meditation and yoga center back in 2009. And at the time I was living in Vancouver and would regularly see the front that they had for the group on one of the main roads. And it sounded fairly innocuous. It was called Life Bliss Meditation Academy. And what they did was, you know, bi-weekly free meditation evenings followed by discourses. And so I, I happened to pop in one evening because they had a sign out front that said, don't miss it. And I thought that means now must be a good time to join this meditation. And from the beginning, had I known what kind of red flags to look out for, like love bombing or group think or people who don't really seem to be in control of their own decision making process, I would have known that this was something to avoid. Um, but back in 2009, there wasn't really much of a public discourse going on about cults. We didn't have things like Scientology and the aftermath from Leah Remini or the vow about Nexium. And so things that now I think would stand out as obvious red flags didn't really register as problematic. Um, so right from the very first meditation evening, they were encouraging me to come back every week and to watch the discourses of the cult leader on YouTube. And you know, everyone seemed like they really believed in it. So I felt like the group kind of gave yeah. credibility to the movement. And so that yeah. was the history. Um, and of course, also back then, if you Googled the name of the leader, which is Nityananda, nothing bad came up about him. There weren't any scandals. There weren't any negative press reports. And of course, that's yeah. completely different now because... As you mentioned, he's an absconded, you know, accused of rape. He's fled India to avoid that trial. And multiple victims have come forward. But it seems like we're kind of beating against a brick wall to try to get something done to stop him. It seems extraordinary that he's gotten away with, with it for now. And it's really frustrating as well. Um, what were the kinds of things then? So, so tell me, as you, know, as you say, we didn't have as much awareness back then. I mean, how far in did you get and, and when did you start to become suspicious? I, I got in pretty much to the top of the organization as far as the public face is concerned. So between 2009 to about 2015, I would come and go from India. I paid for the programs. I continued to live my life in Canada while also being a full believer in this fake guru. Um, but in 2015, he convinced me to move to India permanently and to take the vow of what they call sannyas, which is like a monastic Hindu vow. Mm -hmm. So in 2015, I broke my lease, left my business behind, took the kavi, which is like the saffron rope of a Hindu nun. And at first, it seemed kind of like a, a dream place to live. There was a morning routine that involved yoga and meditation and everyone there had a different department that they would work in. And I can see now that he created kind of like a Potemkin village for newcomers where everything looked great on the surface. And it's only once he understood somebody was fully committed that that honeymoon phase ended and the abuse would begin. So the abuse in the form of sleep deprivation at first, um, setting up unrealistic expectations for our productivity so that we constantly felt like we were underachieving and we had to prove ourselves. Um, so as far as how far did I go in the organization, um, he gave me the assignment to become the Western face of his movement. So every day I had to do two hour long live TV shows that were call in questions about meditation and yoga and Hinduism. No script, no planning. It had to be completely spontaneously done on camera. Um, I had to introduce him on stage before every program. But meanwhile, behind the scenes, he was yelling at me and calling me worthless and calling me stupid and telling me that I was failing him as a disciple because I hadn't brought enough people as new recruits. And so it, it was kind of a weird 
juxtaposition of being expected to hold down the stage show while also having kind of self-esteem destroyed. And this is just my example. Like everyone who was there had a similar, um, a similar experience of at first being praised for whatever contribution they're making to the group and then later being shut down for supposedly not doing enough. Hmm. That went on until about 2018. And, you know, the, the big moment, that I guess the straw that broke the camel back for me was when two of the kids who were attending his school confided in me that they were getting beaten and that they didn't know who to talk to about that. Yeah. Um, he had a residential school. He, he would swindle parents by claiming if they put their kids into a regular school in the West, even if it's a private school, even if it's really highly accredited, the most their child can expect to become is a CEO or a successful person in entertainment or politics. But that if they put their child in his school, their child will develop superpowers. You know, why just be a CEO if their child can be a god incarnate? So he was conning parents into giving him the absolute trust for the care of their children by making these grandiose promises. Um, one of the kids who was beaten, her parents were promised that she would become the next prime minister of India if she stayed in his gurukuls. And so... Yeah, pa parents were willing to turn a blind eye to the abuse because of their ambition um, to see their children kind of raised to a prominent position within his cult. That's awful. A lot of the you see, so now with I, I gather you've seen things like the vow and Scientology in the aftermath. Yeah. Um, are these? I mean, sleep deprivation, for example. Are these all things that you think are common uh, in this cult, whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce? And and do you think that he had even studied? those those cults perhaps yes he absolutely studied scientology because when he first started his western mission in 2006 he gave copies of the book dianetics to all of the initial leaders of his organization no way. and yeah one one of the first podcasters to interview me after i went public was the late ron miscavige um he's david miscavige's father and the day after he released part one of our interview, Nityananda gave a public discourse where he said anybody who attacks Scientology is attacking consciousness. Um, he claims L. Ron Hubbard was the incarnation of an ancient Rishi, which is like an enlightened sage. Um, so yeah, he, he was definitely a big fan of Hubbard. I don't know that he would have learned anything from Keith Raniere just because they were committing their abuse simultaneously. Um, but I'm sure he would be an apologist for what Raniere did because they're so similar. Um, but yeah, he, he was a big fan of any man who abused power. Like I was listening to your last guest and found that conversation fascinating and inspiring because it's true. Whistleblowers do get attacked. And I think the biggest thing all of these cult leaders learned from the Scientology model is this concept of fair game, that if somebody leaves and speaks out, do whatever you have to do to destroy them, but shut them up. And I feel like that's the biggest takeaway Nityananda um, took from Hubbard. So in the early days, like back in 2010, there was a video leaked to the Indian media of this fraudulent cult leader in bed with a fairly famous South Indian actress. And up until that time, he had claimed to be celibate. So it was a huge scandal in India. And what he immediately did was abuse litigation to try to attack anybody who was involved with leaking that video. So the man who had initially approached Sun TV, which was the Indian news channel, with the footage was hit with retaliatory fake rape cases by multiple women within the organization. Um, they sued Sun TV. When a rape victim finally came forward against Nityananda, she was sued in 10 different civil cases within the U.S., all to be heard on the same day. So she lost by default because she didn't have the legal acumen to know how to 
represent herself or to have the cases stayed since she couldn't physically be in 10 places at once. Um, her name is Ardi Rao, and I think she's the biggest hero of this story because she really put her neck on the line back when the cult still had power. Um, so I, I felt kind of in a, in a bad position when these kids told me they were getting beaten because I know the history this cult has is that whenever somebody comes forward and talks about their abuse, that person will be destroyed. And they, they did try to get somebody to take a false rape case against me. I've been falsely accused of rape by three of the members of this cult. Um, they've made YouTube videos describing in horrific detail things that obviously I didn't do, but that they claim I did. Um, they've accused me of starting my own cult and saying, you know, the reason Sarah Landry knows so much about mind control is that she brainwashes people. Um, they accused me of, of, you know, co-conspiring with Ron Miscavige to try to stop the world from getting enlightened because he's trying to take down Scientology and I'm trying to take down this fringe branch that claims to be Hindu. So it's, it's really tough. You know, I, I feel for all the whistleblowers across the board, whether it's political or in the entertainment industry or in a cult, because it's like we have to make the decision to move on with our lives quietly, which enables the abuse to continue, or to speak out against the abuse and risk a lifetime of litigation nightmare and character assassination. Um, but obviously, for me, kids getting beaten makes it a no-brainer. Did, did you ever fear for your life once you left? Big time, yeah. Uh, about a week after I went public, Nityananda introduced something that he called apat sanya. And in Sanskrit, the word apat means emergency. And so he created a new branch of his monastic group that was charged with the task to destroy me by any means necessary. And he said, if somebody is attacking your guru, that person is attacking your possibility for enlightenment, which is the purpose of life itself. And that if you have to kill in order to preserve the capacity for humanity to reach enlightenment, it's justified. And so oh around the world, they were posting screenshots every day, um, mainly on Facebook, which is where Nityananda does the majority of his recruiting of people, married people, single people, young people, old people, putting on orange clothing, taking selfies, declaring themselves to be apat sonyasis of Nityananda. And I got death threats. Um, I went to my local police and they told me, if it's happening on Facebook, stay off of Facebook. Um, they cautioned me not to go to India. So at that time, I was planning to, well, I did file police reports with the Indian police about the child abuse. Um, they ignored my complaints and told me that I have to appear in person at the police station in order for them to file it as an FIR. But again, local police had told me, don't, don't go to India. They felt that would be a trap. So right. similarly, I, I have friends who exposed Nexium and they've told me Keith was trying to lure them to Mexico, like Mexican Reporters were inviting them to come to Mexico to give interviews. They believe that would have been a setup. So it's, it is. It's it really is scary. Fun. How does it yeah. feel to have that hanging over your head? And also, Sarah, when you were in the cult and quite high up, would, would you have been somebody as a true believer who might have wanted to hurt others who left? I would never have wanted to hurt anybody physically, but I would have definitely participated in the disinformation or the character attack against people who left, not believing that I'm spreading a lie, but because we were told these people are lying about Swamiji, which is what they called Nityananda. So for example, Ardi Rao, his first public rape victim, we were told that she lusted after him, but he's a celibate sannyasi and that's inappropriate. And because she felt rejected, she made up this story accusing him of rape because she wanted to believe that she was sexually attractive to him. 
And so we were told she abused him. She's lying about him. She's trying to destroy his reputation. But this is the real truth about her. And then we were given fake medical reports that stated that she had multiple STDs. And we were told if she had actually been raped by Nityananda, he would have contracted these same STDs. But here's his clean bill of health. Spread this all over social media. So we were actively encouraged. And not only encouraged, we were forced. They would sometimes gather all of us in the courtyard of his building. And we had to prove that we had shared these fake stories about Ardi Rao to 40 different Facebook groups or Facebook pages before they would let us leave and and continue with our dates. So I did Mm. participate in a lot of the attacks against previous whistleblowers. And, you know, this is part of what made it hard for me to go public was that I knew how orchestrated their retaliation was going to be. From having lived it on both sides, I knew they're not going to just accept the fact that I'm speaking out. But, yeah, it it feels... Yeah. It feels necessary. Go ahead. No, no. I was, I was just, I was just going to ask um, um, about about the actual the actual message of the cult. Of often, ex Scientologists I speak to, or former Nixium members, will say that there there are sort of grains of goodness in them, which is what got them into the cults in the first place. It, it, was that what was keeping you there? And what what kinds of things what were they? Yeah, absolutely. So very similarly to the the way Scientology was built up, this cult was built up claiming that a certain number of people, we were told initially 100,000, later that became 10 million, that if 10 million people are initiated into the lifestyle of living enlightenment, the world is going to advance into a new era of peace. And that if we want to see things like war and famine and the exploitation of minorities and in my case i've always been an animal rights activist he told me specifically if you bring followers to me i'll make sure that animal agriculture is put to an end and so that was the carrot he dangled to make me continue to believe that what i was doing was something good for the world um and of of course that's very jonestowny very yes there are unbelievable parallels between Jonestown that I've Oh, go on. Noted. Well, and Jim Jones, towards the end, he started restricting the diets of his followers further and further. Like, one day they're allowed to eat carrots. The next day he says he's discovered some new biblical reference that carrots are evil. Nityananda did the same thing. So initially, everyone had to follow what's called a satvic vegetarian diet, which is vegetarian with no garlic, no onions, no mushrooms, no green chili. But he started limiting the foods people are allowed to eat. So now no food that's not genetically originating from India can be eaten by his followers. So, for example, if corn corn and, and wheat flour and canola are not found in the ancient Hindu scriptures, they're not allowed to eat it. So people have an unbelievably restricted diet, mainly white rice and sambar, which is like a runny stew. Um, He's also actively encouraged his devotees to be okay with the concept of a mass suicide. And I think this is the most frightening thing he's doing. Um, When he was originally arrested in 2010, he brought a group of his close disciples together once he was released and berated them because he claims if this had happened to a Buddhist leader, for example, Tibetan Buddhist leaders, when when the Tibetans were kind of pushed out of their autonomy, they had certain monks self-immolate in protest. And he yelled at his inner circle and said, if even one of you had lit yourself on fire outside of my prison cell, they would have let me go immediately. Why didn't you do that? And so he was, he punished them. He made them do a a certain form of tapas, which is making a a ring-shaped circle in the ground outside of his temple 
lit on fire. They had to sit within these rings of fire for hours every day as a penance for not killing themselves for his freedom. Um, there was a, a wow. group, yeah, a, a group session that he had. He invited about 80 of us back to his ashram once he was released from prison. And there were rumors that he was going to be arrested again for the Ardi Rao rape case. And they made us all sign in blood, like cut our fingers and then sign in blood a document stating that if he was arrested, we would go on a starvation diet outside of his cell until he's released or until we all die. And wow, this was in This is crazy. Yeah. Sorry, sir, I interrupted you. No, don't be sorry, but it is crazy. Um, and then most recently in 2018, one of, one of the things that was kind of building up to my exit from the cult before the kids told me about the beatings was that he told all of us in a live, you know, public discourse that if your guru is being insulted, it's better to kill yourself than to listen to those insults. Because if you listen to the insults, you are participating in the abuse of the master. So there are people who follow him who are so frightened of listening to somebody like me or anybody who speaks out against him that they would rather end their life than engage in a discourse and open conversation about his legitimacy. And that's what really scares me. You know, people in India, especially, he's become a meme because a lot of the things he says are just ridiculous. Like he claims he can make cows and monkeys speak Tamil and speak Sanskrit. And that goes viral because it's so absurd. But I feel like he's hiding behind the absurdity. And there's an actual danger and an actual threat. Like kids have already been beat. Men, women, and children have already been raped by him. He's already proven himself to be, you know, a, a fraud, a con artist. He's made away with millions of dollars from people. And I just think it's yeah. crazy. We can't really get any action taken to stop him. Like there's a blue corner notice issued by Interpol. Why not a red corner notice? I, I feel like the scale of his crimes are so far beyond the actual, um, the actual charges that have been brought against him. But I feel like there has to be, there has to be something to escalate the case. Which is why I'm grateful. Is he still? Oh, go on. Oh, no, just that I'm, I'm grateful for this interview and any chance to speak about it. Because one thing I learned from Nexium is that FBI didn't do anything to stop Keith Ranieri until there was a public outcry. So I'm hoping to generate something like that against Nityananda. Yeah. Well, I hope that people watching this will feel that way as well and are sufficiently outraged because I feel outraged angry just hearing it um is he still at large then with you know big cults of followers because it does start to sound very jonestown very heaven's gate uh you know he's obviously mentioning ending one's life more and more it's a really scary case and I, I, like you are i'm afraid i think that it'll be by the time we've done anything about it it'll be too too late i guess yeah absolutely he still he is still free nobody knows where he is in the world and this is part of the reason for the Interpol Blue Corner notice is that he fled India without a valid passport. His passport was expired. He is wanted in court or on a non-bailable warrant for a rape case. But somehow he was able to leave the country of India. Um, he has been in Trinidad and Tobago. From there, he moved to Ecuador. From Ecuador, he moved to Haiti. And since Haiti, nobody knows where he is physically. That was his last reported um, resident. So he has a lot of very powerful, very wealthy devotees, mainly American. And these people are pulling all kinds of strings to get him to get him free. And not only that, just this morning, I had a Google alert notification that the UN is recognizing him as a persecuted minority leader. Because they're petitioning the UN. Yeah. Oh, it just I'm too I'm too angry now. Sarah, where can people go and like hear more about this or find are you speaking out about it? Do you have a channel or and stuff? 
I do. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel that's just my name, Sarah Landry. I'm tweeting about this regularly. I'm in the process of building a website. I'm sorry, I don't have it ready yet to share with you. But when I do, maybe I can send it over. Um, okay. And well, that there's, was, there's, a docu- sorry, there's a docu-series made by Vice, uh, Vice Studios that's called My Daughter Joined the Cult on Discovery Plus Worldwide. And that's of the beginning of the story of Nityananda. People, go check it out. Uh, give Sarah some support for being brave enough to come on here. Sarah, thank you so much, and and do have you know keep safe and have a lovely uh, rest of your your day.